The American Farmer is brought to you by the National Farmers Organization with news coverage of injustices at the marketplace, Washington hearings on foreign investments in American farm land, and why farmers and ranchers need to sell together and use collective bargaining. For more on these stories, here's NFO News Analyst Phil Allen. People who aren't in farming don't understand the injustices farmers face when they sell in the old marketing system. Doris McElwain, NFO Women's Coordinator, and Willis Rowell, Legislative Representative, are here to discuss it. What about that, Doris? We could explain what farmers mean by injustices in the old marketing system, perhaps, by giving some examples. Here's one on grade A milk. The dairyman usually doesn't know what he's going to get for it until the buyer has used it. If the handler bottles it, he pays one price. If he makes cottage cheese, ice cream, or yogurt, he pays less. If he makes butter, nonfat dry milk, or cheese, he pays even less. And in many cases, it's nearly a month before the farmer knows how it's going to turn out when he gets his check. Well, Doris, how would this compare to a common consumer item if the farmer is in the position of the consumer? Well, let's say that you go in and buy a pair of shoes, and you tell the man in the shoe store that if you're going to use them for work shoes, you will pay him $15. Now, if you decide when you get home that you want to use them for dress shoes, then you might pay him 20 However, if you decided to use them for both, you could give him seventeen fifty. <laughs> and that would be the blend price. Absolutely. But you wouldn't do it until you took it home and used it and decided. Well, I think Doris is right about the injustices in the old marketing system. Uh, Willis Rowell, you've been around agriculture a long time. Can you describe some of these ridiculous situations that farmers are in? Can you imagine a farmer going into a fertilizer store, buying his fertilizer, weighing it on his scales, grading it according to his standards, and then telling the dealer what he's willing to pay for that quality today? Well, why not? That's the way the farmer sells his products. You mentioned one uh, thing to me about going into a hardware store. That would be similar, too. It's the same type of situation. Uh, take your own scales into the hardware store. Tell the shopkeeper how many nails you want, weigh them on your scales, grade them according to your standards, and then tell them what you're going to pay that day. You've mentioned now things that farmers have to buy, the inputs in agriculture. Now what about their main commodity crops? Well, did you ever wonder why the buyer of a load of grain has the privilege of weighing and grading and testing and pricing the grain? But if the farmer buys a load of grain from the same elevator, suddenly the, the seller has all of these privileges. Uh, Willis, you were in purebred livestock in agriculture. Why is that? That has something to do with this buying and selling too, doesn't it? Well, I always wanted to be in a position where I could have a voice in, in pricing my products. And in purebred uh, livestock, I could do this. I always priced my bulls to the people who bought from me. I always priced my breeding heifers to the people who bought from me. Well, Doris, what's the moral to this story that Willis told about the bulls? Well, I would say this, that when he was setting his price, he was selling to another farmer. And when he had to sell like a farmer, he had to let the other guy price it the way a farmer does. Willis, what would you suggest farmers do to cope with this situation? The correction to this is one of the great services the NFO has been able to pr provide its members. Uh, the collection, dispatch, and delivery system is a system of livestock collection points, grain accumulation points, dairy reload stations that are, in most cases, owned by farmers, but in all cases are controlled and operated by farmers so that the farmer himself has his employee doing the weighing, the grading, and the testing. This uh, should help assure farmers com some more of the complete justice they're looking for at the marketplace. You made a very good comment to me the other day about this, that if the NFO had never accomplished anything else, the fact that it would put farmers in a position to do this, go through that again, will you? Well, I think it's something that farmers have needed for so long. And I would repeat, if the NFO has never done anything else for farmers, providing them a way, a method, and teaching them how to control their own business through the, this collection, dispatch, and deliver, delivery system, it certainly has been a great service to farmers. Doris McElwain and Willis Rowell of the National Farmers Organization, in Justices at the Marketplace. As the public becomes more and more aware of foreign investments in American farmland, it becomes clear that neither the Congress nor the journalists 
seem to know enough about how much farmland is being bought up or by whom. We talked to Charles Fraser, who heads the Washington office of the National Farmers Organization. He gave testimony at recent hearings, and he listened to other groups and individuals testifying before a subcommittee headed by Congressman Rick Noland of Minnesota. He noted that some witnesses played down the threat because they said only a tiny percentage of American land to date has been bought up by foreign investors. In my view, it is an important question for two reasons. First, the land they are buying is generally rich, top quality farmland located close to some of our best transportation and some of our markets. In other words, they're buying good land with a view to making a profit on it and as a hedge against the devaluation of the dollar and other currencies throughout the world. Secondly, the purchases so far seem to reflect the interest of investors in Japan, Italy, Germany, the Netherlands, and a few other countries. It is reported that the large reserve of Arab oil money is being placed in other types of investments. But just suppose that they decide with the trillions of dollars that they're going to accumulate in the next few years to start buying American farmland. Charles Fraser also noted that some witnesses, including some government witnesses, testified as to the need for outside capital in our agriculture. I don't buy this viewpoint. Those investments will be made in the land the profits will be taken out of the community. Large acreages of land owned by foreigners obviously will be managed by professional management outfits that are not necessarily involved in the support of churches, local business houses, and the community projects that are supported by our independent farmer owner operators or that represent our traditional form of farming in this country. We asked Charles Fraser about other countries which have laws preventing American capital from investing in their farmland. As a matter of fact, Switzerland, Mexico, and I believe some of the countries of Western Europe do have restrictions on outside investments in their farmland. In other words, they recognize that rich farmland is a valuable resource, finite in character. We only have so much of it, and that it is to be protected and preserved as a part of our way of life. The National Farmers Organization has supported legislation for a long time, the Family Farm Act. And we asked Mr. Fraser about that. The thrust of my testimony was to encourage the Congress to take up the Family Farm Antitrust Act that has been languishing in the judiciary committees for several years. This legislation would prevent large corporate structures whose principal business is outside the area of farming and who have non-farm assets of at least three million dollars or more from owning and operating American farmland. That was Charles Fraser who heads the Washington office of the National Farmers Organization on his recent testimony on foreign investments in American land. It isn't strange at all that one of NFO's top men in slaughter cattle would address a whole hog sausage supper. Livestock, whether hogs or cattle or sheep and lambs or feeder stock, tends to rise and fall in the market with the success of other kinds of livestock, or feed grains for that matter. So Walter Hackney, director of operations for the NFO Slaughter Cattle Division, talked to a whole hog sausage supper at Ellsworth, Wisconsin, a leading dairy state. Hackney said some interesting things about why he left an executive job in the packing industry to come with the National Farmers Organization. I have seen and I have studied every farm organization for the last four years. And this is the only 
organization that exists that moves agricultural commodities that does not take possession but only moves, moves them as a service organization. I did not want to be in the position of taking possession again from an American farmer. I'd watched my family go broke because of it. I was going to try to put any talent I may have developed over on the side of trying to be of a service with that talent to that American farmer. Hackney reviews recent statements by the Secretary of Agriculture, Bob Berglund, about raising beef import quotas and the effect on cattle prices. When they made that June 8th announcement, they made a statement, and I heard Berglund make another asinine statement comparable to it in Wisconsin last week, that with that announcement, it was only 200 million pounds of beef. It was less than one pound per capita, and spread out over your yearly consumption, it would and could not affect the market maybe more than one or two cents a hundred weight. And he made the same statement last week, and we'd lost $18.50 a hundred. Now, do you want to tell me that you're going to sit on your duffs and wait for the government to bail you out and give you a profit rather than organize and go after it yourselves? Now, the government bailed you out of a hundred and some dollars a head in 26 days. Do you want them to bail you out of another hundred and twenty-some dollars a head in the next month? Don't you think for a minute they can't do it. Walter Hackney with some words about what needs to be done now. Y'all better wake up or get out of the business. There's no sense of letting cattle. There isn't any sense of letting two, two and a quarter corn. There isn't any sense of letting four or five dollar beans break you and stand out there being stubborn as a jackass and wave your American flag. There isn't any sense to that, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm going to tell you something else. Your area bankers aren't going to let you do that again. You go down the tube one more time and you walk in that bank one more time with the stupidity of having tried to market your product by yourself and lose your fanny and he's going to ask you to go down to Chippewa Falls and go to work for that corporation and get on that meat floor and cut meat all day long for four or five bucks an hour. That's what you're going to be doing. And you young men and you young wives in this audience, you better believe what I'm telling you. And why cattlemen need to sell together. I don't care whether you belong to the National Farmers Organization. That's completely immaterial to me. But you better belong to some organization that collectively blocks and markets your commodity for you. And I think if you do what I did for the past four years and search for an organization that can do that specific thing, you'll probably come back to the National Farmers Organization. Otherwise, you're going to go down the tube. Because there isn't another organization that handles product in this manner. It's simple as that. That was Walter Hackney, Director of Operations for the NFO Slaughter Cattle Division. Phil Allen for NFO News. And that for today is something to think about.